I'm about to predict the future. Ready? In mid-2061, Halley's Comet will be visible to the naked eye from Earth. Mark your calendars, because I'm as confident as could be. The comet has been observed by astronomers since 240 BC at the very latest. It's a little bit shy, coming to the inner solar system only once every 75 to 76 years, but you can count on its return just as much as you can count on the sun rising tomorrow. Halley's Comet is amazing enough by itself, but maybe even more amazing is what it illustrates. And that is that our universe is governed by predictable systems of patterns. These systems, over billions of years, gave rise to everything that we see around us. Black holes, stars, deserts, fish, worms, and the god king of the new age, Andrew Yang. The existence of these systems makes numbers really useful for trying to describe and predict the way the world around us will behave. Written math is an ancient practice, dating all the way back to the Sumerians around 3000 BC. Their systems were first applied to metrology, which allowed for sophisticated systems of measurement. They also invented the multiplication table, which is pretty handy. Not long after this, civilizations such as ancient Egypt and Elba began to discover the value of numbers and started using algebra and geometry to solve problems related to the world around them. This practice was used to help with everything from commerce to recording time, but it also paved the way for the human journey to understand the laws of nature by organizing it into systems. Gravity, a force with a long and storied history, is a great example of this. Aristotle, all the way back in the 4th century BC, used the term gravitas to explain why all matter tends towards a single point. All bodies move towards their natural place, which is why land matter and water tend towards the center of the Earth, which he thought of as the center of our universe. His ideas were expanded on in ancient India. Aryabhata used this force to explain why the rotation of the Earth doesn't cause objects to fly out towards towards space. And Brahmagupta, just years after him in the 6th century AD, laid the foundation for our understanding of gravity as an attractive force. He called it Guru Vakarshan, and centuries of work has been done by other mathematicians to help us better understand this process. In our modern understanding, we've identified four fundamental forces. Gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. These forces, and the numbers used to describe them, write the story of our universe. Projects like Solar System Scope help us better understand this story by allowing us to explore a simple 3D model of our solar system. When we increase the speed of time, we can easily see the awesome machinery of our universe. It's remarkably predictable. Our universe presents itself in distinct patterns that we can measure using numbers. In this way, we are gradually uncovering the rulebook for our universe. The planets and people, stars and sky, Lush forests and worlds uncounted all ride the same tides in a vast cosmic sea. Are we alone in all of this vastness? One problem that we have when trying to answer this question is that potential life might have evolved really differently than us. So differently, in fact, that they might have different senses entirely. Sending an auditory or visual message is completely pointless if the aliens can't see or hear. After all, they're probably not going to look like little green people. Instead, we have to speak the language of nature. SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, has been trying to solve this problem since their founding in 1984. One tool that might be of some use to us is using mathematical concepts as a sort of universal dictionary. After all, any alien smart enough to detect Earth have probably discovered math, right? Well, Hans Freudenthal certainly thought so, leading him to write Linkos, Design of a Language for Cosmic Intercourse, a math-based language designed to be understood by extraterrestrials. It goes over concepts such as natural numbers, mathematical operators, units of time, human behavior and communication, and even some basic physics concepts. The dictionary would be transmitted towards the potential source of life. After we have the fundamentals, we can send any kind of message that we want. It's pretty fun. Take a look at these examples. Freudenthal planned a second book that would have established even more concepts, but it was unfortunately never finished. That hasn't stopped other people from exploring the concept further, though. Projects such as Cosmic OS and Lingua Cosmica have similar approaches. Some signs of life can be misleading, though. 
On November 28, 1967, Jocelyn Burnell stumbled upon a great mystery. In the night sky was a pulsing jet of electromagnetic radiation, seemingly flashing on and off. Even stranger, it did so at entirely regular intervals. Could this be a sign of some sort of alien intelligence thousands of light years away trying to communicate with us? It's a radio pulsar. These previously undiscovered neutron stars pump powerful beams of electromagnetic radiation out of their electric pulse. They rotate at regular intervals, every 1.33 seconds in this pulsar's case, and the electromagnetic radiation can only be detected when the source is pointed at us. The emission is happening constantly, but it appears to us as if it's turning on and off. So no aliens. Bummer. Pulsars are a great example of how regular patterns are presented to us because of the fixed laws of nature. Here's another one. The speed of light in a vacuum is 186,282 miles per second. But did you know that it's possible to slow down the speed of light so much that a cheetah can outrun it? In 2001, a team of researchers exploited the fact that light will slow down as it passes through a material such as water or glass. Using extremely cold sodium atoms, they were able to slow the light down to just 38 miles per hour. That's pretty cool. But as far as we know, it's still impossible to exceed the speed of light in a vacuum. This causes some really weird stuff to happen as you approach that universal speed limit. One fun one is that it opens the door to time travel. The faster an object moves, the slower time goes for that object relative to an object at rest. In October of 1971, this effect was demonstrated observationally in the famous Haffel heating experiment. In this experiment, the researchers set up one atomic clock on the ground, and several more atomic clocks were put on planes that then flew around the world. When the planes landed, an eerie conclusion of Einstein's theory of relativity was confirmed. The clocks on the planes were ticking more slowly than the clock on the ground. If a parent were to hop on a spaceship, and fly around the universe at close to the speed of light, they could return to Earth and find themselves to be younger than their kids. That doesn't seem like it should be possible, but it is. Remember that the laws of nature don't have to make any sense to us in order to be true. On that note, what would happen if we were to zoom into the universe instead of zooming out into space? Well, the answer is that things get really weird really quickly. At small scales, everything is made of atoms. You, the Earth, even the computer that you're watching this on right now. And atoms are really, really tiny. In just one grain of sand, there's roughly one quintillion, 200 quadrillion atoms. Atoms are way too small for the human mind to even begin to comprehend. But that's not even the smallest things can get. Every single atom is composed of subatomic particles, the most well-known of which are protons, neutrons, and electrons. And two of these, protons and neutrons, are made of even smaller pieces called quarks, which some physicists consider to be the most fundamental unit of matter. And at the subatomic level, the laws of nature that make so much sense to us on our scale begin to break down. The concept of uncertainty is a really good way to illustrate this. When I drop this coffee cup, it falls to the ground every single time. And I don't have to guess about things like if the sun's gonna rise in the morning. I know that it will because it follows a predictable set of rules. But in quantum mechanics, the system of math used to describe subatomic particles, we are unable to perfectly predict the result of a given action. For instance, it is unable to predict the exact location of a particle, only the probability that it'll be in a given location. The distinction between waves and particles breaks down at this scale too. This concept, called wave-particle duality, highlights the limits in our current understanding of both waves and particles. As theoretical physicist Richard Feynman put it, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. A final theory, or a theory of everything, is a hypothetical framework that will allow us to reconcile what we see on the quantum level with what we observe in our everyday lives. Despite several contending theories, not one has emerged as a clear answer to this problem yet. What keeps the machinery of the universe chugging along moment to moment? Despite the confidence espoused by generations of scientific, political, and religious leaders, not a single human in the history of our species 
has been able to say with confidence that they can answer this question. Why does the universe have the forces it does? Why don't they change the way they work moment to moment? Why does any of this even exist at all? The answer to all of these questions seems to be that that's just the way the universe works. It's the oldest and greatest mystery there ever was. Confused? Don't worry, because in this universe, the insanity is palpable. Thanks for watching, and until next time. When the planes landed, an eerie conclusion of Einstein, Einstein, Jesus.